good evening and a very warm welcome to all the fellow panelists. Thank you so much for taking time out to share your thoughts on so a very interesting topic. And when I looked at it, I said attention economy, again, a new buzzword that we listen to these days with following up with clearer pathways or more muddled waters. That means we only want to cause more confusion in our conversations and we are taking this forward. So I want to simplify this for all of us. I want to start with, uh, you know, if, if consumers today are, you know, uh, there is an information overload that they go through, starting with, let's say, uh, you know, Sunil, uh, you personally, what is the information overload that you yourself experience as, a, as, a, as an individual? And then come to us and what do you think consumers experience in the overload that you see in terms of information? So uh, I guess I, I, it's not only me, but I think all of us is overloaded with a lot of information today and in the world where, uh, what we call as a VUCA world, where information is bombarded from all the brands, even if you don't want to engage with them, right? So it's happening, and I think if we look at our uh, consumers from last 24 uh, years, if you look at 2020, the attention span was close to 18 seconds. Then uh, in 2010, it was close to 12 seconds. Then come down to three seconds, I think, it just two years before. And, and I was reading an article on uh, this Sunday, last Sunday, on social media, the attention span is now 1.5 seconds. So. So why are we losing attention? Because we are bombarded with a lot of communication these days. And, and uh, uh, this is where we need the change that how uh, people want uh, brands to, when they're communicating, how personalized that communication could be, right? And I, I believe there are a lot of examples available in the market, which I'm sure that fellow panelists will answer on that. But uh, as in a communication perspective, I think it's give a lot of responsibility to us as a marketer that when we are reaching out to our consumer and, and thanks to all the tools and technology which are available today, that we can go more sharper and I think that's where we all are learning that how we can be more accurate in terms of information when reaching out to consumer and I think within AI is, is one of the big thing which is happening today, uh, I think this personalization is going to help us within AI. So I think we'll conclude this at the end that how whether it's a muddy, uh, muddy water or, 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 or we have a, a, a bright future in, uh, with this AI but yeah, there's a lot for you. But, in a, in a nutshell, if I say, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, content available bombarded to us and uh, it's become responsibility for all of us as a marketer that how we fine tune that and reaching out to the right audience with the right communication, that's, that's the word. So you talked about unprecedented volume and variety of content available across and primarily more obviously in the digital platform. Coming to you, Somesh, on this one, what are other ways that you see with this overload uh, in terms of what's happening to the content proliferation? What about the multi-channel consumption that uh, you know you as individuals or you know consumers go through? Any thoughts on information overload from your side? So I think. Uh Thanks, Anita. Where I will start from, in the last one week, if I were to look at, and you asked, uh, as an individual, do I experience information overload? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I was counting, and uh, I had that time because I was stuck in traffic today, and I was counting last one week how many communication I have received as an individual. Uh, I've got close to 1,000 promotional messages or WhatsApp, which mostly are of brands which I'm not looking for or services I'm not looking for. Uh, when I say messages, WhatsApp, any kind of communication, this includes any medium. I don't want to take any medium, but it would include an SMS, WhatsApp, or any kind of communication that I receive. I would have come across more than uh, 200 to 250 post or some kind of ads or banners. Uh, again, most of it uh, is something which I, uh, none of these products or services I was looking for. Uh, so the point that I'm trying to make, and all of this when I am registered as a DND customer, right? So, so definitely the information overload is there, and uh, you might want to uh, blame it to set of people, uh, some of us sitting here and the others sitting on the other side as well. But the fact is that today uh, we are getting calls from companies uh, again and again where we are saying, uh, you want to buy a house? And 
I am actually not looking for a house. I don't know why I get at least five calls in a day that I'm looking for a house. Probably I searched for it two years back and I'm still getting those calls. So somewhere uh, there is a problem which exists and all of us will have to own it up and we'll have to try to solve for it. Uh, how do we look at it? What do we look at it is something uh, that depends on each product, service and brand. Uh, it cannot be one uh, solution fits for all. Uh, for, a, for a service brand, we call ourselves a service brand, then insurance as a product is something where the only thing that we sell is claims, right? rest of the things uh, is not something that anybody is bothered about when they're buying a general insurance product. And for us, it becomes very important uh, that we communicate at the right point in time. And that is the philosophy that, that we follow and that is something that we, we kind of take care of. And while uh, we try our best, best, we should not be able to kind of reach to a stage where we are bombarding consumers with not so important information, especially we deal with customers mainly when they are in stress. Uh, most of us contact us only when they're buying the product and then they again contact us when they are in a problem or they have a claim with us, right? And hence it becomes even more important that we don't use that information to communicate or try and sell other products. Uh, just one uh, more in, uh, thing that I want to talk about, Anita, here is and how you can try and do that, this as a brand, what we have done. There is one set of communication that we send from a promotional perspective, from a service perspective. But there, there are things that you as a brand can do which doesn't become an information overload, but you are somewhere engaging with the right set of consumers as well. There is an application that we launched which is called here.app. Uh, it is nothing but an insurance-led ecosystem, first of its kind, which helps you engage with consumer in mobility, which helps you con uh, engage with consumers in wellness. Now, we are trying to engage with the customer. We are nowhere trying to sell any product. There are certain nuances that has been looked at. There might be notifications which go to the consumer, but these are very contextual. And hence, it becomes more natural way of communication, engaging with the consumer rather than bombarding them with more and more information. So I think that's, the, uh, that's, that's my view in terms of how you balance out communication and information overload uh, and all the brands will have to kind of look at it. Thanks so much for the context and I genuinely pity you for the thousand messages that you've got over the week. I don't know how much you landed spending time looking at them or just ignored them simply, which again means advertising dollars wasted. Uh, coming to what Sunil talked about saying from 12 seconds to 8 seconds to 4 seconds to now 1.5 seconds. So this, how, the, how advertisers are now looking at this attention economy, I think it's becoming a critical factor to build their strategies. And uh, if you look at the concept of attention is saying the fleeting, uh, you know, scarcity of attention that I'm able to get from a consumer. And speci uh, specifically in digital, this attention is absolutely on high demand because the sheer amount of digital channels itself that you have, where you're able to reach out to the consumer itself is expanding. So in this space, there's a lot of research that's happened in and around, you know, attention economy. Sandeep, I'd like to, you know, have your thoughts on what are the research pieces of work that happens with attention economy, and if there are any findings that you could give us top lines on. Hi, is, yeah, perfect. So when you have, <clears throat> You know, this double web is, so most of my colleagues spoke about the information coming from outside to you. There is a lot of noise that is coming from within as well, right? With all of that polarization happening on social media, there is so much of competition. Uh, you know, you have to be fit, you have to be seen with the cool things, you have to have some something new on your Instagram and WhatsApp status uh, every now and then. There's so much of internal noise as well that is happening, right? Uh, so it becomes very imperative that, uh, you know, as advertisers, as marketeers, we do two or three things very, very well, um, you know, and, and that is the only kind of solution uh, to get better. And, you know, if you do those things, the, all of this clutter can actu actually work in your favor, right? The first one is how can you customize your message as much as possible? Right? There is this uh, concept called segment of one. So rather than devising one message and sending to 3 lakh people, uh, you know, at 9 a.m. in the morning, 
um, you know, do you want a housing loan, do you want a car loan, all of us get that, you know. Can you actually take two, you know, two, two steps of homework and figure out who are the people who are most likely to be in the need of a home loan? Uh, you know, and these days with all of the data proliferation and a lot of uh, models, etc., available, you can, you know, kind of zero down on a target as well as the message, right? So if somebody is a young first jobber, uh, your message could be very different from someone to a mid-career professional, etc. So, so, so micro-segmenting and, uh, you know, fine-tuning your message um, is, is really the first thing that we all need to do. The second is there are also, you know, with the help of technology, quite a lot of research techniques available for you to fine tune that. Like the simplest thing that we all do is before we show, uh, uh, release an outdoor creative these days, we do a simple test which, which you know, figures out where is it that the consumer's eye is going to be there, right? So it's called hot spotting or something, 3M does that. Uh, you get to know precisely where you should be putting your brand logo, precisely where you should be putting in your messaging, etc. So that optimizes that, you know, microsecond of the attention that you're going to eventually get, right? Similarly, there are quite a lot of uh, brain mapping, uh, you know, based techniques, uh, you know, that are available. Uh, one of them is called fMRI, functional MRI, that actually checks which part of the brain is getting activated when the consumer sees uh, your message. All of this is now commercially available. We use that. Mutual Fund CEA has been using that, uh, you know, very regularly. Uh, there are EEG techniques available. So, you know, there are electrodes that are kept on your scalp uh, while you're watching the commercial and you get to see the alpha, beta, theta, gamma, whatever uh, waves and you're able to figure out what uh, result uh, you are going to be getting, uh, you know, out of that. Uh, there are, of course, eye tracking, uh, you know, software available. There are facial coding, uh, you know, techniques that are available. And while you're watching a TVC, I watch your face and I'm able to. So I think plenty of techniques available today for us to further fine tune that and do not depend on this creative brainwave that I've had and you know, hey, I've been doing this for 15 years and I know precisely how to communicate and don't get me all of this newfangled technology. I think those are the mindsets that we need to kind of come uh, out of the shackles uh, with. And the third thing that we need to do is rather than you know, coming to media specifically, rather than looking at the old fuddy duddy matrices like, you know, the TRPs and the, and the viewership, et cetera, et cetera, I think we need to be considering a lot about factors like affinity score, right? So for example, we figured out that mutual fund communication, uh, mutual fund investors uh, have a much, much higher affinity uh, scores of a sports tournament telecast. So therefore you will see most of the times IPL, um, on the IPL we will be putting our ads on, right? So we very clearly understand that even though it is more expensive, that is where my consumer is immersed into the communication rather than trying to bombard them in the middle of a movie, right? So those calls we need to take, we need to be very clear as to in that limited microsecond of attention that you're going to be getting, where is it that the consumer is going to be more immersed into the medium or message uh, so that your communication has a chance to work out better, right? So, you know, just, just to reiterate whatever has been said before, say relevant things, uh, you know, design them in such a fashion that I'm able to understand what you're saying in a, in a fraction of a second, okay, don't take too much of my time, uh, and talk to me when I'm really interested in talking to you, right? There's no point trying to interrupt people's YouTube uh, watching and, you know, show um, some boring communication. So I think these are the three or four things which can help us uh, uh, benefit from this attention overload syndrome and get ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Sandeep. I think you spoke about various uh, dimensions in terms of studies that one year has actually seen on consumer attention. There are consumer behavior studies, there's data analytics, machine learning that today is getting used to understand that a lot better. I'm coming to content optimization and personalization. And Mangesh, I'm bringing you in over here. Uh, in this space on content optimization and personalization, what is it that you're seeing? You know, how is this driving the attention economy? So attention has become the currency now, right? So it's sort of a currency, what we see in marketing and everywhere. And uh, if you look at AI and the role of AI in this, I think we can layer everything with the AI. We are scratching the surface. We are still scratching the surface of AI. And there's a long way to go. And there might be a lot of things about ethical, not ethical, whatever. And I think most of the problems we spoke out here, AI might only solve a lot more with that. Now, coming to attention, AI will solve that in a big way. 
because now you're reading much more into the subject. And AI is learning and we are learning from that. So again, it becomes our duty to analyze and send it back. So attention, still I feel storytelling is the king. So to get attention, it has to be about storytelling. So if your storytelling is different, you will get attention. We are trying to get attention everywhere. That's the mistake we're doing, maybe. It's about, are we consistent in our storytelling? Uh, is the brand speaking in the right way, in the right tone, in the right language? Content, we, we divide content to different baskets, thinking they are different social media platforms. That's not it, because today a person is opening all the platforms together. A podcast today is also content for a brand. Right? So there are a lot of avenues that have opened up. So that makes you know, us to use tech and even to put content to get attention. That's very relevant to know where you're putting what and is the brand speaking in the right tone of voice or no. That makes it more relevant. Thanks, Mangesh. Coming to you, Abraham, on this one, your views on attention economy. Where are you seeing uh, consumers in this space? What are the challenges that you face for a category like yours? Thanks, Anita. Yeah, the older marketers in this room will remember that <clears throat> on multiple forums like this, starting from any time after the single channel Doordarshan era, the conversation's been about clutter, right? You had, uh, you know, the whole cable television thing, and then we talked about clutter. Then DTH came, we had more channels, we talked about clutter again. Then the first wave of the internet, then OTT. We're still talking clutter. I think everything beyond one has been clutter, and we've just sort of we also have to recognize the fact that this is a demand supply thing, right? It's we as customers demand more content, we consume more content, we spend more time with our devices, and, and so more content's being created and thrown at you. So at one level, uh, this is our own making. And I think the good part of it is that now there's so much data that you can pick up and AI and algorithms will give you more content in the areas that you're interested in. Uh, leaving aside the calls for houses that you're not looking for. Uh, but, but there's a whole lot of content that can actually feed or help you grow or nurture a passion or an interest as well. So I think that's the upside of having so much content uh, delivered to you in some form. Uh, to my category specifically, uh, and again, maybe one of the reasons why a lot of unsolicited travel advertising, maybe from Thomas Cook as well, and I apologize in advance, uh, is, is probably coming is because we are also seeing a rapid rise in this whole growth of impulse consumption, right? Especially for categories like ours. Uh, there are no planned holidays like 10 years ago even, right? This whole idea of a summer vacation that was summer holidays for kids and people planned this months in advance, it's completely changed. Uh, this generation and in fact a large part of India today plans a holiday based on the next long weekend, right? and they're planning one week in ahead. So, uh, and very often if I feed the inspiration to you uh, for travel or tell you that, hey, it started snowing in Kashmir, you might start thinking about it right away. So, in a way, we as customers have changed. Uh, we are no longer as, uh, what shall I say, regimented and pre-planned uh, in, in some sense. So we're very big on impulse purchasing and which is why moment marketing is also the phenomenon it is. So I think a lot of the, content that's being thrown to us, maybe more than we sometimes are comfortable with, and sometimes the wrong time, uh, is really coming from the fact that we uh, seek and demand and get inspired by and consume also at, on a very you know, ad hoc basis. It, it's not bad, it's just the way we've evolved as customers. Uh, you can argue, you know, is it a good thing or bad thing? Uh, so I think all marketers are going to ride that, right? I don't think anyone actively thinks about insurance, and I've been an insurance CMO as well, uh, which has been one of the banes of the category, right? How do you create demand in a category that doesn't naturally inspire demand, right? You constantly have to remind them about it and hope at some point uh, a set of circumstances then makes them think about it. Uh, so I think that's my perspective on it. Uh, so of course, the more uh, relevant contextual content about, about travel, uh, using my category, at, at a time which is going to be less inconvenient for you to consume and get inspired by, would probably be the way I'd look at, uh, look at it and possibly use AI and tools like that to look at, okay, when are you likely to be moving, for example, then I recognize that you're in a car 
uh, probably stuck in traffic if you're in a city like Mumbai, probably a good time to, uh, you know, give you something on travel. But I wouldn't want to catch you at 10 o'clock on Monday morning. Thanks for that. I was just wondering while you were talking about this, and I remember in my, you know, earlier days when I started in this industry, we used to have that Doordarshan set, right? And that TV would play, and we would have to see all those ads before we went and saw the Bollywood movie back. To today, when I sit in, and I genuinely feel I've, like, overload of information is, is too minor a word, if I may pull it that way, because you genuinely, to cope up itself, you know, on, 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 the, on the overload of information that we have, to get my attention itself, sometimes I, I genuinely wonder, I don't see the ads, I don't see TV, I, I just switch off my notifications, how the hell is somebody going to kind of reach out to me? So it is a currency which is absolutely important. Uh, I want to now come back to you with all these challenges. What are the channels you think, you know, when you're looking at your marketing campaigns are the ones that you use to drive attention? Sunil, if I could go back to you. So I think I'll take a classic example. Uh, in, um, when I've joined, I have uh, worked with an agency and we created an ad copy. <clears throat> and because I worked with the script writer, uh, the first ad we produced was 54 seconds and because I was uh, so fascinated because I worked on this. I said, no, we'll run this 54 seconds for three months. And initial one was doing fine. And then we started seeing the VTRs are dropping continuously across all the channels. So I said, okay, bring down to 30 seconds. Still, we see the VTR still dropping. And then ultimately, after six months, we come to the conclusion that we'll only run a 10 second TVC from 50 seconds, right? So that's my, my own learning that how, how we need to cut down onto the entire bombarding of communication and have a short and crisp communications across everywhere. And I think from that's the day and today's the day, most of our communication, even on social media posts, are not more than 10 seconds, right? So this is the kind of, kind of adaptations we have taken all the, uh, throughout our journeys and learned over the years, and I think that's, that's what we are implementing now to get the better ROIs from whatever we do today. No, I like the fact that you've looked at the scarcity of the attention in terms of the second digits going down, and then actually pulling up your messaging and your durations into things that will really work for you as an advertiser. So it's great to see the format change, the duration change, et cetera, and everything right up from sometimes the five second skip ones that you create interesting campaigns out of. So Mish, coming to you on this one, any suggestions from your side? So uh, Anita, what I, what I think, is two things which are happening uh, and most of us I think said in different ways it's very important to be relevant it's very important to be contextual right uh, till the time you're relevant to the audience uh, there is no one mantra in terms of uh, use these three mediums and you'll you'll be able to reach out to the right set of people be because the medium the uh, the channel that you want to kind of interact with depends on what is the kind of communication you are doing and who's the target audience uh, just to give you an example, uh, there was a very, and, and one of the points uh, uh, I also completely agree with, which has been said by one of the panelists as well, storytelling is very important. I mean, media uh, consumption habits, you need to understand uh, based on your target audience, but storytelling is equally important. If you are not sure what do you want to communicate, how do you want to communicate what your proposition is, then um, it's waste of the media money as well, marketing dollars as well. Uh, just to give you two examples that I want to give, what we did and how, what are our learnings. Uh, we started a kind of a movement which we wanted to start as one of the leading private insurance brand uh, in the country. Uh, we said there are people, there are segments who are not really insured, while the overall penetration of insurance itself is very low, but there are lower segments, there are people who work in our uh, uh, house, there are maids, there are drivers, who don't understand what insurance is. And Raksha Vandan was one, uh, uh, one time when, when we thought all of us have a maid who cooks at our place, um, especially in cities like uh, Bombay and Delhi, and we don't really uh, never go and talk to that Didi whether you really want to kind of buy a health insurance. And we never thought of giving uh, uh, health insurance to that Didi when, when it comes to uh, uh, on, on a Raksha Bandhan or any of the festivals. We, we instead give 1,000 rupees or 1,500 rupees or probably one month salary. And that's where the creative agency and we sat together and that was the storytelling that we did, which was very strong storytelling that rather than, you know, uh, giving you just one month salary, I'm giving you a health insurance which will sustain for all your life and this is 
this will actually help you when, when you really need it. And that was the story, very strong storytelling that we did. Without even doing a campaign, there were 2.7 million views uh, in five to seven days that we saw. Now that's the power of storytelling that I'm talking about. The second bit that I, that I spoke about is around con being contextual, being relevant. And that's where I'll bring uh, the second example that I earlier as well spoke about. Our philosophy is very, is, is very clear. You need to go and capture mind share and not the market share. Market share will follow. And if you really want to capture the mind share, there you need to be relevant. We went to the consumers. Today is the age where you don't only do data collection, you use data analytics. Today is the age where you don't really say, I think my consumer will do this. Instead, you go and say, I know my consumer is doing this. This is the behavior that my consumer has, and hence my strategy, my marketing strategy, my product strategy, everything needs to be based on the data analytics that you have. You can't just collect the data and not do anything about it. And that's where we went to the consumers. We, and uh, I said, we used to think that consumer will like this. We took 16 propositions to around 20,000 consumers. We tested them. Out of them, six propositions on mobility and health and wellness, something that we, uh, we uh, came out as winners in that research. And that is where we went ahead and launched in our application. Today I see and all the big fours of the consultants come and say the engagement rates that we are seeing in our application is much better than what we used to see. And that's the true example of how you can use data analytics. That's the true example of how you can understand the consumer psyche and then go and launch a proposition. Uh, so I think the, uh, again, uh, again and again, either it is communication, either it is product, either it is servicing, you need to be relevant, you need to be contextual, and the storytelling needs to happen across, because these days people only understand stories, and that's why probably influencers are doing so good, because they're good in storytelling, right? I think, uh, thanks, I, I think good stuff in terms of trying to tell us if the story is great, obviously impact is coming. I take the other one very well, saying get the mind share, market share will follow. So again, a great one to saying if you've got mind share, which means you need to drive their attention again, hopefully then obviously your sales are picking up. I'm coming to another touch point, which today is very well talked about and is, is making waves in terms of how do you understand this piece, which is the connected TV audiences. Uh, with the linear TV and digital coming together, co forming this connected TV world, uh, Sandeep, to you, what is it that you're seeing the connected TV audiences gives you in terms of data, et cetera, and everything which you, which you could then you know, use for your campaigns? So, uh, do, do you want me to focus more on the defects or do I talk about... Uh, you, you can talk about uh, connected TV campaigns. from the point of view yeah. of, let's say, for example, a re, uh, you know, a recommendation engine like Netflix, sure. which really talks about how are they using data and analytics in the entire space. You can talk around, there is data available today for you to get much more inciting work, things in and around that. So I'll give you two examples, uh, you know, rather than describing too much about what we did, I'll just give you two examples. One of them is bang into this uh, generative AI space and how do you use that technology and all that it has to take your brand message forward, right? Last uh, Women's Day, uh, 15 days before Women's Day, uh, a profile came up on all social media, you know, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and LinkedIn and stuff. There was this lady called Aishwarya Desai, and uh, she said, uh, I do want to share with you the success that I've had uh, by investing in mutual funds very, very religiously for the last 15 years. Uh, and then she shared her entire life, you know, how she decided to invest from her first salary and the pictures of, you know, her being in college and uh, then the, the, her first car and you know, the house and the family and foreign vacations and stuff. She would post three or four times in a day and you could see her entire life story and she also shared that I invested in this fund, that was my SIP and you know, because of which I was able to achieve all of that. Uh, and there was a lot of traction. There were about 18,000 odd people who started following her. There used to be about 50, 60 conversations about you are our inspiration. You know, here is my question, how, how you can guide me and so on and so forth. On Women's Day, she declares that, uh, you know, I am an AI-generated avatar. I'm not real. Um, you know, this is done to uh, spread awareness about what can investing uh, religiously over a long period of time can do to you. 
All right. Uh, so what this tells you is, uh, and of course, all of this where AI helped us. I mean, if I were to do this without AI, this was impossible, right? How do you find a model which looks like you 15 years ago and all of that? Uh, but AI could do that, um, you know. So this was basically an example of you leverage technology uh, to tell a story that you wish to tell, uh, and that gets you the kind of. Uh, and, and, and see, hitherto, uh, Abe will know. We used to give illustrations and you know examples and stuff like that. Here was a real person sharing her life, uh, you know, and those images were um, you know generated by AI. So this is one example that I would give you. The second one is how do you break through the clutter and, uh, you know, without using any AI, you can still get the attention that you require, right? So this is now recent, about a year ago, we started a series called Straight from the Fund Manager. Now the problem with mutual funds industry is that fund management is kind of a black box, correct? So you believe a particular company and you believe a particular fund manager, but that man doesn't talk to you, that woman doesn't talk to you, you do not know what they do with your money. Uh, so we broke that, you know, archetype and we said that every quarter, every major fund manager of Nippon would go onto social media, would say that, hey, I manage this particular fund and this is what I do, this is, these are my strategies, this has worked in the last quarter, this has not worked in the last quarter, this is what I've learned and this is what I'm going to be doing uh, in the next few quarters and it was almost like a sales pitch saying that this is why, he didn't say this, but it meant that this is why you should trust me and put your money in my fund and continue uh, putting in my money, whether it was a great performance, not good performance, because you would see a human behind, you could see the process behind and you could see the genuineness uh, of an effort behind, right? So there was no AI involved, uh, but it broke through. We of course sent it to all the investors of that particular fund, uh, we sent it to all the partners who sent it forward uh, to distributors, etc. So the relevant content, right? So, uh, so the, the title itself is very clear. This is a seven minute video of XYZ fund manager of Nippon India Growth Fund telling you what you did in the last quarter and how we, why you should be kind of staying invested in it. Amazing response, amazing view through rates and you know, great uh, traction. Uh, so two examples to illustrate. How do you get attention? Leveraging AI and ML. So I'll again come back, Mangesh, to you because when I look at connected TV and the advantages, the fact is it's a small screen moving from a mobile screen to a tab to finally you watching TV, but via a smart TV, right? So you're actually consuming Netflix, Amazon, et cetera, and everything on that connected TV. Uh, it has options like targeted advertising, interactive content. How is it that you think advertisers could use the advantages of connected TV to drive attention? I think connected TV or any other digital platform, it's still integrated and you use it, you use all mediums connected together. So I don't see only connected TV playing a big role. I feel all mediums, like I'll, I'll just take a simple example, like we do IPL and IPL is one of the biggest things that we do and we did a simple drone show last time. Okay, so whether we got a special time on connected TV to show it off, but that content was picked up on social media everywhere. So it's the content and then you're playing it. Now connected TV, yeah, what, what is happening with connected TV is I can focus, connect the ads. But still, if you are doing something like a big show, like a drone show, it's for everyone. And I, you are saying connected TV because I can pick up audience. So that becomes a very good format for me when I'm advertising. But it, it also narrows down a lot. I feel a mix, amalgamation of all media is still the game. It's, it's, it's not only about you know, just being into connected TV or one source like that. Again, my personal view on that. And we've always used a mix of mediums to get better results. And I still believe that's still a way to go till some more time. Thanks, Mangesh. Coming to you, Abraham, any thoughts on what you would like to talk about on this subject? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite a big proponent for connected TV uh, for a couple of reasons. One uh, is that if you think about most urban affluent households today, uh, almost anybody who's replaced the television in the last five years has replaced it with the connected TV. Uh, so that's good news because from a category like ours, which is high uh, disposable income base, uh, it's, it's better to be targeting a more focused segment, which typically is, tends to be, uh, not always, uh, urban affluent, right? So the bigger screen formats and people are using more advanced connected TVs are automatically a good way to filter out 
people who typically I would otherwise be spending a lot of money to reach. Two is because of the nature of my category, the bigger the screen, the better the sound of experience, the more immersive it is, uh, the better the, the, the inspiration, if you will, to travel. Uh, so it's also very uh, categ category oriented. Um, I, I, would, I would assume if it was uh, not a category like ours and it may not be uh, that relevant to have a big screen and you know, show a beautiful waterfall or you know, surf hitting your face kind of effect, a bigger screen obviously helps and the more UHD uh, kind of effects you can get, the better. So uh, definitely connected TV, A, helps from uh, an added level of filter uh, point of view, besides interest, cohorts, all that. Uh, so that's at the media level. This is a device level filter. Uh, it also helps deliver the message better, right? Uh, in a more immersive, memorable, uh, dramatic way. A and I think for sure, wherever we've used connected TV uh, emphasis uh, in our campaigns, we've seen definitely a more qualitative oriented conversion uh, level metric. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite a big fan. No, so that's great because also from a number point of view, the, the actual pricing on that will be relatively lesser and if you're getting your right audiences in, you're able to make that work harder for you. I'm coming to the next one, which is really around the regulatory landscape that we see in driving this uh, AI piece that we are talking about, the ethical adoption of that. Any perspectives and point of views that you would like to pick up on the regulatory environment? You want to go, Abraham? Uh, I think the, uh, meaning I was listening to the earlier panel as well, and I think the one thing, uh, obviously we're talking about a cookie-less future and, uh, you know, a lot, whole lot of regulation in terms of protecting customer data. So I think the regulatory framework around that, uh, there is obviously a draft out and it's uh, mirroring a lot of what we've seen happen in the EU and the US. So I think a lot of emphasis on uh, the kind of data that have been given to us as marketers and how we'll have to protect it, I think that's uh, going to be big. Uh, and I think a lot of responsibility and serious implications for marketers who treat it lightly. Uh, so that's something for all of us to watch out on. It's both an opportunity and a threat because I think a lot of the thousand odd messages we spoke of hopefully may not happen. Uh, and a lot of frivolous data sharing uh, you know, that's happening today, data selling, uh, you know, that's happening on the black market, I think will also disappear. Uh, the second piece is the regulatory framework around AI, which I think, uh, again, the panel earlier spoke about. Uh, that's something that uh, we need to see because the, 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 uh, the game itself is evolving, so I think the regulatory framework will have to sort of uh, grow with it. But I think that's something, again, that, that's important to see how that pans out because it can have huge implications uh, you know, which can either manage the positive impact of AI helping us all at large or taking us down the dark side, as we call it. So, Neil, back time, to you. Yeah, yeah I, because I'll your this, uh, category I I itself, I think, is a regulatory one from pharma. So, I'm sure you have a strong so perspective I, on it. I, I just forget the AI for now. I think every piece of banner in the TVC we make, we have to go for MLR approval. Uh, so, yes, uh, you're assuming, right, that we have a tough time in getting our campaigns approved from our medical, legal, and regulatory. But I'll, I'll just give you an example. I was, I, I, I think this is, this is on February 6th, uh, and in Hong Kong, uh, there is a deep fake video use of an CFO, and, uh, and, and the video call, uh, 25 million US dollar has been asked to transfer by the bank, and this money has been transferred. So if, if uh, so uh, when it comes to regulating AI, I think, uh, I believe four or five countries, which is your European Union, Brazil, Singapore, and US, and maybe one more, they have some laws on organizations who are working on AI, but uh, if I take in India, Germany, any other countries, there are no laws practically on this scenario. And uh, if, if you take our own country example, uh, I think the data privacy law passed uh, in Lok Sabha last year in August, and I think we are still waiting for the implementation, right? So uh, uh, the water's going to get muddy if there is no regulations on this. So I think if you want to really look at a clear path in future, I believe uh, uh, our authorities within the government and, and the bodies like, like, like an advertising associations should come up with a regulation which can regulate the AI, otherwise the, the water will definitely get more dear. Thank you. Mangesh, coming to you, just one example of a case study which you feel you've, has been inspiration to you for driving attention. Anything that comes to your mind? L 
lot of case studies actually and uh, like I spoke about the drone show that we did, that, that was one. But I, one very simple uh, case study that comes to my mind is for driving attention is uh, Chroma did something last year on the whole of Howrah Bridge. They did that Bengali Rangoli Alona. Very simple execution. Like I, I hold that great because it's a simple idea. But again, the attention that it got was huge. And uh, actually, if you look at it, if someone would have told me this is the idea, I would have said, it's very simple. It's too simple to be done. But they did it on Howrah Bridge. The extent that it went on to, the social media that buzz that it got, everything. And I think uh, the best thing that they did was they stuck an emotional cord. And whenever advertising or marketing touches an emotional cord, there's nothing better than that. And th I, that I would see as a case study. It was a very simple case study, but I thought it was the most beautiful case study I'd seen. Sandeep, anyone from your side? Uh, I um, have been observing uh, Cadbury doing, uh, you know, amazing work uh, year after year after year. But this Valentine's Day, they are telling you uh, to share, I think, some incident of your life and some caricatures of you and your partner, and they would do an AI video or something. I think uh, while I'm not very sure what does that to, does that what that does to the brand, but I guess you know this is being done very very consistently over the last three or four years. So I said. Uh, I would look at them as some kind of an inspiration in the Indian context. Um, and if this, looking at there's only one minute left, uh, I do want to also share my last, uh, you know, nugget of wisdom that I have kind of gathered over my uh, four years of mostly failed attempts at uh, working with uh, generative AI. Uh, you know, it's a humongous power, uh, but you still have to exercise a lot of uh, your own uh, discretion, judgment, wisdom, uh, and you need to figure out what uh, and where you want to use it with. Right? So there are issues, data issues, there are, uh, you know, uh, patent issues, uh, you know, uh, uh, intellectual property rights issues and stuff like that. So it's almost like that uh, little joke that keeps coming on WhatsApp that, you know, there is this engine and that was not working and, you know, one engineer was called in, he took a hammer, he tapped somewhere and, uh, you know, he sent a bill for $1,000. Uh, and people said, come on, you know, for, for one, uh, one little uh, nudge, you can't charge me $1,000. So he said, uh, please break this down. And, you know, he said that $1 is for the hammer and $999 for knowing where to hit it. Right? So that is really uh, very, very crucial uh, if you were to win with the AI and ML. Thank you. Okay, my last one, and you can choose only one. Muddle water, so clearer paths. Abraham? I think clear up path because... Mangesh? Sorry. I think it's clearer path, but still a little time to go. Like, it will float in between for some time, but clearer path for sure. I see it more positive than anything negative there. Sandeep? I won't say it is positive or negative. I would say it is here. Uh, it's in this hall. It is staring at us in our face, and, you know, we got to do the best uh, that we can. It's a reality. So, so Mesh? Deal with it. Absolutely clearer path. Okay. <laughs> Nothing else. Sunil? Yeah, obviously clear path, but I think we need to be very careful what, what we're going to get into here. Thank you. So I'm just going to wrap that up because I genuinely feel the clearer paths actually give you refined strategies. It gives you data-driven decision-making uh, pieces. It gives you regulatory guidelines as well. So that's where the clearer paths come in. I still think there's complexity because there's an evolving consumer behavior. There's competition for attention, and there are ethical dilemmas that we all need to solve for. So to end it up, navigating this terrain between clearer paths and complexity will require a balance of innovation, ethical awareness, and adaptability to evolving attention patterns. Thank you so much, gentlemen. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the panel.